A reading from the book of Malachi. See, the day is coming, burning like an oven, when all the arrogant and all evildoers will be summoned. That day comes, shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. But for you who revere my name, the sun of righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings. Word of God, word of life. Thanks. Thanks. A reading from the book of 2 Thessalonians. Now we command you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, to keep away from every brother or sister living irresponsibly and not according to the tradition that they received from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us. We were not irresponsible when we were with you, and we did not eat anyone's bread without paying for it. But with toil and labor we worked night and day, so that we might not burden any of you. This was not because we do not have the right, but in order to give you that example to imitate. For even when we were with you, we gave you this command. Anyone unwilling to work should not eat. For we hear that some of you are living irresponsibly, mere busybodies, not doing any work. Now such persons we command and exhort unto the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly and to earn their own living. Brothers and sisters, do not be weary in doing what is right. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God.
Holy Gospel today comes to us from Luke. When some were speaking about the temple, how it was adorned with beautiful stones and gifts get dedicated to God, Jesus said, As for these things that you see, the days will come when not one stone will be left upon another. All will be thrown down. And they asked him, Teacher, when will this be? And what will be the sign that this is about to take place? And Jesus said, Beware that you are not led astray, for many will come in my name and say, I am he, and the time is near. Do not go after them. When you hear of wars and insurrections, do not be terrified. For these things must take place first, but the end will not follow immediately. And then he said to them, Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes and in various places famines and plagues, and there will be dreadful portents and great signs from heaven. But before all of this occurs, they will arrest you and persecute you. They will hand you over to synagogues and prisons, and you will be brought before kings and governors because of my name. This will give you an opportunity to testify. So make up your minds not to prepare your defense in advance, for I will give you words and a wisdom that none of your opponents will be able to withstand or contradict. You will be betrayed, even by parents and brothers, by relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death. You will be hated by all because of my name, but not a hair of your head will perish. By your endurance, you will gain your souls. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Oh, goodness gracious. I really hate some of the readings from today. I'm just going to own that. It's not that they're necessarily bad, it's just that they're abused, they're misused. It's really easy to take some of them out of context and find all sorts of ways to use them to beat the tar out of other people or minimize other people or find other ways of just not caring about other people. And I hate that. It's almost, almost at the point now, I will confess, after 13 years of ministry where it's just, I find it tiring. It's like, ugh, i got to deal with people being obnoxious to each other again. Great. The Thessalonians one is the thing that's coming to mind for me right now. I don't know if anyone else caught it. For me, it just clangs like a cowbell, but not in the good, noise-filled way. As soon as I heard it today, it just, oh, I remembered it again. 2 Thessalonians 3, 6 through 13. I could have looked it up faster if I had marked it beforehand. Let's all watch me do it in real time. What is it? Oh, this line right here. Uh, all about idleness, idleness, idleness. It's so Paul. It's very delightfully Paul. What is it? It's the one here about... For you yourselves know how, to ought, how you ought to imitate us. We were not idle when we were with you, and we did not eat anyone's bread without paying for it. But with toil and labor, we worked night and day, so we might not burden any of you. And then he goes on talking about not feeding people. And some people read this, and they're just like, oh, great. Well, that must mean we don't care about the poor anymore. That's not what he's getting at. I don't know why I feel so tired right now. I'm giving you the worst possible setup for this. That's what it is. I'm trying to soften it. Sorry, I'm thinking out loud right now. That's probably what it is. I'm just making it easier so they'll be like, oh, well, Chris isn't coming back, but that's okay this time. Paul was not a systematic theologian. I'm going to throw a couple seminary things at you right now, and I apologize in advance. Paul was not a systematic theologian. That is to say, Paul did not sit down and say, okay, when I write these letters to all of these early churches thousands of years ago, my goal as I am doing this is to set up this full system of how I see the world. My goal as I do this is to build this intricate way of viewing God and theology and how it all fits together so that someone can take this and then use it and extrapolate and understand how to see the world. Paul was what we would call a situational theologian. A situational theologian is someone who is addressing the needs of the moment. You follow me? Well, you gave me the nod. I'm so happy. Thank you. What Paul is doing right here in this letter to the Thessalonians, he's writing to them about their context. He's writing to them about their reality, their world, what they're dealing with. 
And what sometimes people have done over time is they've taken bits from Paul in particular, where he is writing to a specific congregation with specific needs and specific context, and they take all of that and they say, oh, well, obviously this must be the one size fits all he then wants us to extrapolate and use for everything. Paul literally says in this letter, not to feed people unless they're doing the work. You caught that, right? And there are those who will take that and they will say, well, this means that every feeding program out there, every way of supporting individuals who are in need must be off base because those lazy, lazy, lazy poor people aren't doing their work. That's, that's an abuse. That's an abuse of the letter. That's not what he's getting at. In fact, what's hilarious, it was well, hilarious in the sense that it's in Greek, so it's not actually funny. But, really? Not even a chuckle for that? Come on. Some of you must have been watching the Seahawks game. What's hilarious in this is that if you look at it in the Greek, he actually says, um, he, he uses wordplay. He talks about ergozomai, which means to work. And he talks about peri ergozomai, which means to meddle. And at the end here, when he talks about the busybodies, he's talking about the meddlers. He's talking about the people who not only aren't contributing, but are actually detracting from the good of the community. Because they're trying to throw everyone else off base, everyone else off direction. Not necessarily because they're bad people, but just because they're misguided. So that reading, it just, it drives me a little bit bonkers. But then it flows into this Luke reading that we got today, the thing I'm supposed to spend most of my time with you today on, I believe. Or at least everyone assumes that I will. Teacher, when will this be, and what will be the sign that this is about to take place? You remember what Jesus has just said to them? What's he just said? It's not a trick question. What's coming down? The temple, right? Not a stone will be left on top of a stone. That whole thing, we heard it just a few minutes ago. How human is that reaction to that? When will this happen? They didn't ask how. You catch that? We take it for granted. Sorry, I'm fiddling with the mic all over the place today. I don't know who was here last week, but I disagree with how they had this set up. It was me, it was the last one. Well, shows, thanks. Thanks for that, Jerry. Appreciate you having my back like that. Real time, even. They don't ask how it's going to happen. They don't ask why it's going to happen. They ask when. And you could take that, you could say, well, okay, well, it's because they have so much faith in Jesus that he says this and they just take it for granted that he says that it must be true. And that's why they say when. They don't care about the other things. I'm unconvinced. I'm unconvinced. I think they say when for the very common, selfish, human reason that they want to know if they're going to have to deal with it or not. Neither stone will be left upon stone. Well, when's this going to happen, Jesus? Do I have time to step out for a while? Can I avoid this? This is going to be someone else's problem, right? It's happening down the road. I don't have to face it right now. It's not imminent, is it? I had plans. I had all sorts of other things I was going to be doing. I, I really am hoping that we can delay this a little bit, right, Jesus? I could go off on a rant right now about all sorts of fun things that will tick somebody off. I could talk about climate change. Let's be honest, it's an elephant in the room. We wait for it long enough, none of us as individuals have to deal with it, right? I mean, that's very human of us to do that. We as human beings occupy very finite periods of time. We're only here for so long. You know, the longest of us are what? Maybe, maybe we hit 90-something, 100-something? The course of history, the course of scripture, the course of creation is much longer than that. The things that we have been called to do as Christians are much bigger than that. 
That's okay. I actually had my cousin have that to her. Uh, it happened to her once during her wedding. She's a pastor. It was hilarious. Bride was up there getting all set. Sears was calling to make sure that her registry was all taken care of. <laughs> this tells you how long ago it was that I said Sears. <laughs> we as human beings lose track of that all the time, but there is a bigger picture at play. There is a bigger story at work. The course of creation as God has made it and as we experience it, they're not the same. God's time is not our time. I'm going to call an audible on myself. Do you have a bulletin in front of you right now? Yeah. Some of you do? If you don't, that's fine. It's not a quiz. I couldn't help but notice this, that the song that's being offered up after this, Act Justly, Love Mercy, Walk Humbly, it's not from one of the readings from today. You know where it's from? Do justice, love mercy, walk humbly. It's from Micah. It's from Micah 6, 8. One of the minor prophets. It's sad that we call him a minor prophet because it's a really good line. Do, jo do justice, love, mercy, walk humbly. If I was to describe to you what it means to live out our Christian life, I think those six words encompass it pretty darn well. Now, as many of you know, before I showed up today to kind of fumble my way through the first few readings, I spent four years working as a pastor in our state prison system. And I was very heavily exposed to what our system considers to be justice. There are four ways that I'm aware of to look at justice. There might be more. Retributive justice is one of the most common ones. That's what I saw every day inside the prison. That's where someone does something wrong and you punish them. Retribution, a form of justice, retributive justice. There's other forms of justice. There's distributive justice. That is to say that you make sure everything is handed out equally. Or you take it to the next step and you make sure that it is handed out in a way that people get what they actually need. Maybe some of you have seen that meme uh, online at some point of the people trying to look over a fence to see into a baseball game. There's so one really tall person, one about mid-size, one really short. And the idea being that you know if you give each one of those people a box to look over the fence, the tall one doesn't need it, the short one needs two of them. So to just distribute it completely equally is actually not really helping the situation. <clears throat> this person needs the other box, you know? There's also procedural justice. That's where you just make sure that things are done in a way that seems fair and equitable. That the policies are good. But there's a fourth form of justice. That's restorative justice. When I was working inside the prison, I was honored to work a little bit with an organization called Bridges to Life, which is an offender victim reconciliation project that, of all places, came out of Texas. I found that fascinating. I'm not going to lie to you. If I was to peg, like, hey, which state is it going to be coming out of, that would not be in my top five, which says something about me and my biases. But the idea behind this program is really cool because what it does is it takes individuals who have committed crimes and it takes individuals who've been victims of crimes and finds ways to restore relationship and to restore community. It recognizes that at the heart of justice, at the heart of actual divine justice, is this idea of restoring creation, restoring community, restoring relationships. Some of you will remember, maybe, I don't know, but maybe you will because I say it now. Some of you will remember that in the past I've talked to you about how the real core to the Christian faith, the simple words of Jesus to, what is the commandments that he gives? To love the Lord, your God, with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. Not a trick question, guys. I'm assuming it was at least going on in your head, even if you didn't say it out loud. 
those relationships that we have with God, that we have with each other, and I dare say you take it one step further, those relationships we have with ourselves. Those healings of relationships, that's what this is all about. That's what it means to follow Christ. That's what it means to really live into this faith that we claim for ourselves. It isn't about sitting around and waiting like, wait, is today the end day? Is today when it's all over? Is today the day that the temple comes tumbling down? <coughs> it's not about avoiding that responsibility. It's not about setting it aside and kicking it down the road and hoping we don't have to deal with it. It's about acting. It's about loving. said today not to worry about what we will say in our defense because he will give us the words as we need them. My hope and my prayer for each of us as individuals is that the reason we don't have to worry about those words is that we have nothing to defend. That we have lived our lives faithfully that we have lived our lives striving to our utter core to honor these words of Christ, to find ways to do justice, to love mercy, to walk humbly, to love God, to love each other. Pardon me to just believe in care. To be Christian is a verb. It is an action. It is not a noun. It's not something static that we sit on the shelf. We look at from time to time and say, oh, that's cute. Look at that. I've got my Christian label. What else can I collect today? It is to struggle with our reality. It is to struggle with the brokenness of relationships, the brokenness of systems. And it is to recognize that in that struggle, God is with us. God will always be with us. And we may not see the end of that. We may not see the temple coming down. We may not see justice restored. We may not see creation as it is supposed to be. In fact, truth be known, probably we won't. And so we should stop worrying about that. And just get down to the active work that we know we've been called to do. Amen.